Okay, we're going to turn right up here onto Lakeside Avenue. All right, got it. Hey, there's Lake Champlain right over there to our left. Yep, yep. Uh, we'll have to tip our hats to yes. Champy, the lake monsters we drive by. We covered that legend, what was it, episode 38? Yep, that was it. Uh, so we're not in Burlington, Vermont, looking for a lake monster this time. We're actually looking for a ghost a little further up this street. Ooh, a ghost on this street? Yeah, you see that large brick smokestack up there on the left? I do. Uh, so that used to be part of the Queen City Cotton Mill. Now, once we reach the train tracks just ahead, we're in the right spot. All right, I, I can see the train bridge right there. All right, we're passing under the tracks right now. Pull over just ahead, because it turns out this underpass was built by a ghost. Hey, I'm Jeff Belanger. And I'm Ray Osher. Welcome to episode 198, getting close to 200, yes. of the New England Legends podcast. If you give us about 10 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. Burlington, Vermont is the next stop on our mission to chronicle every legend in New England, one story at a time. We're a community of legend seekers who love keeping these stories and the past alive. We appreciate when you get involved in our super secret Facebook group, when you download our free New England Legends app for your smartphone so you can check out all the locations we've covered for yourself, and when you visit our website to see video clips from the New England Legends television series that you can watch right now on Amazon Prime. And while you're on our website, please nominate your regional faves for a Boney Award. We want to find the best of New England. All right. Now, before we go looking for a ghost by these Burlington train tracks, we need to take just a minute to tell you all about our sponsor, Nuwadi Herbals. Like last week, we wanted you guys to hear from the Nuwadi Herbals founder, Rod Jackson. Rod, we've got to know, how do you come up with all the funny and interesting names for your products? We like to have fun when creating the names, but still let the people know what the product is intended to do. But in one case, a customer named a T. I made it for a woman who had stomach issues, and she said that it was the only thing that had ever calmed the storm in her stomach, and that tea became calming the storm. When we developed a laxative tea, we just had to go with Bear in the Woods. The name of Share My Blanket just conjures up a picture of lovers cuddled under a blanket. Kimberly named our award-winning product TPT for prostate support, and it always brings a laugh. So how do we come up with the names? We just have fun. I love it. Thank you, Rod. Yeah. No matter what you call them, these teas, bombs, and essential oils help me get through the day. These are herbal remedies from Mother Earth. Check out the Nuwadi Herbals website to see all of their great products. And you legendary listeners, you get 20% off your order when you use the promo code LEGENDS20 at checkout. Visit NuwadiHerbals.com. That's N-U-W-A-T-I Herbals with an S dot com. All right, Jeff. So you're telling me that this underpass and bridge on Lakeside Avenue in Burlington was built by a ghost? <laughs> it was. All right. But this is an actual bridge made of steel and sitting on concrete foundations. Yep. I, I get it. Totally true. With a paved road underneath <laughs> with storm drains, you know, everything else. Yeah, I get it. So this ghost must be a structural engineer and construction worker of some kind. <laughs> is that true? Uh, yeah, I see how you think that, but not quite. We're actually looking for the ghost of a young woman who died in this very spot. Let's head back to June of 1900 and meet her. It's June 29th, 1900, and we're standing outside a massive brick building with a tall smokestack. This is the Queen City Cotton Mill. The business employs hundreds of people who work multiple shifts per day to churn out fabric and other cotton products. One half of the building is about three stories tall, while the other half sprawls out for several acres and is two stories tall. There aren't a lot of trees around here right now. I, I can clearly see Lake Champlain just a few hundred feet in the distance. It's 6.30 in the evening, and this factory is bustling. A shift of workers are walking up to the building, coming back from their dinner break. Among them are 22-year-old Mary Blair, her sister, and another female friend, all chatting as they walk up to the building. The Rutland Railroad tracks run right by the Queen City Cotton Mill. Workers need to cross the tracks to get to work. And with the train coming, they need to hurry. Sometimes long freight trains come through here and can force workers to wait several minutes until the train passes by in order to get to the building. When your work shift is about to start, several minutes can mean the difference between getting to work on time and getting your pay docked for being late. The three young women are making their way up to the tracks, but the train is getting close. Oh, man, I'm nervous. 
You can clearly see the train is coming. They, they better hurry. Okay, the three women, they're, they're, they're scampering across the tracks. Oh, and, oh, oh, no. Man, no. Oh, oh, God. Oh, Mary was just hit by the train's engine. Her body went flying. This is terrible. Young Mary didn't stand a chance. The newspapers cover the story. Struck by the flyer. Mary Blair, a girl, 22 years of age and an employee at the Queen City Cotton Company's mill, was struck by the 640 train on the Rutland Railroad last evening at the crossing at Lakeside Park and instantly killed. She, with her sister and a girlfriend, were returning to work. Two of the party crossed the track in safety, but Miss Blair was not quick enough and was struck by the engine and thrown about 75 feet. She was badly bruised in all parts of the body, there being a bad gash on the right side of her head, and her right arm was broken. Several other bones were also broken. The accident was, as nearly as can be learned, due wholly to carelessness on the part of Miss Blair. The reporter goes on to describe how the crossing is near the middle of a one-mile straightaway in the tracks. The train's whistle was blowing and the bells ringing. Mary Blair had plenty of warning and should have waited to cross the tracks. A horrible and tragic accident that ended a young life. And though Mary is gone, this is not the end of the story. Just a few months later, strange events start to happen in the mill, especially late at night, when it's just the night watchman. It's now November. It's just after midnight, and the Queen City Mill is quiet, which is exactly what the night watchman expects. He's in his mid-40s, a sane and sober fellow, as his friends describe him. On most nights, this job is pretty boring, but that's how he likes it quiet. But then, the silence is broken. The weaving looms are running. That only happens when the factory is full of workers. Something is up. The night watchman races to the machines to find six of them running at full speed. Cloth is being woven without any guidance. As the watchman looks on, the machines, the machines stop. The watchman scratches his head. He's never seen this happen before, but nothing seems missing, and there's no sign of a break-in. He makes a note to file a report that these machines may be on the fritz. But later that night, the night watchman is making his rounds when he spots a glowing white figure pacing back and forth in the workroom. Unsure of who or what this could be, he approaches. But then she vanishes. He reports all of the night's events to the mill's authorities in the morning, And that's when his managers weigh in. (laughs) (laughs) Really? (laughs) But this sane and sober night watchman vows to return to his duties this evening and bring along some friends to bear witness. With two other friends in tow, the night watchman settles in for his shift. The first few hours pass as they often do, quiet. Pretty soon his friends are bored and feeling foolish at spending their free night looking for ghosts. But then, the weaving looms are running again, and once again producing cloth with no one around to tend to them. And once again, the glowing white specter of a woman makes an appearance in the workroom. The night watchman's friends are now firm believers in ghosts. These events continue for several nights in a row, with even more people coming by to witness the strangeness. They also see strange flitting lights and hear odd sounds, But that's just inside the building. There's also strange activities afoot outside as well. Out on the train tracks near the mill, train engineers are reporting things that just shouldn't be happening. Those supernatural reports even make it to the newspaper. The young woman was killed by a Rutland railroad engine, which at night is attached to the train leaving the city at 10.06 o'clock, and is run by the engineer who was aboard the engine when the girl was killed. The headlight of this engine is an electric one, and it is controlled by storage batteries directly behind it. Each night as the train nears the spot where the accident occurred, a white figure is seen to walk on the track along the path, followed by the victim of the accident. When the train strikes the spot, the headlight goes out and does not light again until the spot is passed. Of course, the mill's management deny any knowledge of the ghosts, but still, people talk. Workers talk. And the ghostly activity continues. And though a ghost haunting the train tracks is frightening, it's not nearly as scary as the other near misses that occur at this crossing in the coming years. 
It's January of 1908, and the Queen City mill workers are demanding a safer way to get to work. 500 mill workers need to cross these tracks multiple times a day. What happened to Mary Blair is going to happen again. Ultimately, it's agreed that an underpass will be constructed so workers can safely walk underneath the train tracks. And that brings us back to today. Okay, now I get how a ghost built this underpass. Right. Someone died here. The event haunted the Queen City factory workers. Sure, a ghostly legend can force you to look both ways before crossing the tracks where your colleague met her end. But after a while, you start to get angry that your safety just isn't a priority for your employer. In this case, a ghost forced some changes. And the underpass is still here. It is still here. But most of the giant Queen City cotton factory is gone. The iconic smokestack still stands, and part of the former mill building is now home to various offices. But I can't help but wonder what strange sounds those workers may still hear inside late at night. Hmm, it does make you look over your shoulder, doesn't it? (laughs) It does. Hey, we'd love for you legendary listeners to join our growing list of Patreon patrons. These folks are the backbone of what we do. They keep us going and growing. Plus, they get early access to new episodes and bonus episodes and content that no one else gets to hear. Just head over to patreon.com slash New England Legends to sign up. Please consider telling a friend or two about our show as well. Yeah. Share your favorite episodes on your social media pages. We appreciate your help getting the word out. You can also call or text our legend line anytime at 617-444-9683. You can even leave our show closing on there for us. We'd like to thank Michael Leggy for lending his voice acting talent this week. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Nuwadi Herbals, and our theme music is by John Judd. Hey, everybody, this is Andrew McGuire, your self-proclaimed New England Legends road dog, calling you currently from Nebraska. Just wanted to call in and remind everybody that the bazaar is closer than you think. <laughs>